Hello, it is Dr. Isom. I'm here to give you the first part of a lecture on personality assessment. I will be introducing the idea of personality assessment, why we do it, a little background history, and then a brief description of the types of personality tests that are used. Why do we measure personality? One of the main reasons that we measure personality is because often people just want to have a better understanding of themselves. Having a better understanding of yourself can help you when you're trying to identify the most appropriate career for you or what you would like to study in school, what fits your interests and your motivations. So they're often used by career counselors. They're also often used by clinicians. There are times when the clinician needs to have a very full understanding of a person's personality so that they can identify appropriate diagnoses and develop the best possible intervention. Personality tests are also used by employers often when they would like to get more information about people that they might be interested in hiring or promoting. If you've ever worked a job in retail, you may have taken one of those tests that employers give called an integrity test which is actually just a form of the Big Five conscientiousness scale and has been shown to predict honesty, dependability, and work ethic. There are multiple government agencies that often include personality testing as part of their application process, including the CIA, the FBI, and the military. With all these people using personality testing for such important purposes, it's really important that we have a good understanding of which tests are valid tests and which tests are not because there are a lot of junk tests out there. In fact, there are currently over 2,000 personality tests on the market and most of them are knockoffs of something called the Myers-Briggs, which we will study later in the semester, that is not a well-validated nor reliable test at all although it is really fun and interesting to take. It's really crucial that we as psychologists have a good understanding of the tests that are well validated and the tests that we know to be less useful in understanding people. And the difference between a well validated test and a junk test is not always really obvious. So we need to have a better understanding of what personality tests measure, how personality tests are constructed, how they work, and more importantly, how they can fail. The first thing to refresh our memory on is what personality is. You'll remember that our definition of personality is based on Allport's definition, and that's that personality is a person's characteristic patterns of their thoughts or their beliefs, their behaviors or their actions, and their emotional experiences or their feelings. These three things, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, are thought to be relatively consistent throughout a person's lifespan. And therefore, we should be able to measure them reliably. One of the first, if not the first, formal personality assessments was something called the Woodworth Psychoneurotic Inventory, or the Woodworth Personality Data Sheet. This is the first known personality inventory, and it was created by the military. They realized that not every soldier was cut out for being on the battlefield. And there were many soldiers that, although they seemed to be relatively in good mental health, when they were put into the war in a battlefield situation, some of the soldiers did not handle it well. And many developed shell shock, or what we now know to be PTSD, after their experiences on the front lines. Training soldiers was really expensive. So the Army wanted to figure out a way that they could identify which soldiers would be best on the battlefield and which would be better in non-combat positions in the military. They began to do this by having psychologists interview each recruit individually. But after a short time, they realized this was a really expensive and time-consuming venture. And so a gentleman by the name of Woodworth developed this series of questions. And these are questions that the psychologists used to use in their interviews. And they would administer this to each soldier and then look at their scores to identify which soldiers had personality characteristics or mental health characteristics that would make them better suited for the battlefield and which had personality characteristics that made them better suited for a job that was not on the battlefield.
Again, this was created during World War I when they were trying to mass screen and identify the soldiers that would be the best fit for fighting on the front line. The format of this first personality test was objective, which I will get into more detail later in this lecture, but objective personality tests have yes or no, true, false, Likert type scale format. And you can see as the example shows here on the right, it was simply a list of questions that soldiers answered yes or no to. And the psychologist would identify the questions that were problematic and use that as a way of predicting which soldiers would be better on the battlefield and which soldiers would be better with a non-combat position. Here are some other sample items. You can see that some of the questions were interesting and reading through them, you might think, hmm, I wonder if soldiers were completely honest when they were answering these questions. Because some of them are asking things that are potentially embarrassing or information that you may not want to disclose to people. This brings up the idea of response biases. And in particular, this brings up one called social desirability. Social desirability is a response bias that happens when you're answering questions about things that if you give the true answer about yourself, it may cause others to perceive you as having personality characteristics that are not socially desirable. These questions in particular, people are out to get me, I drink a quart of whiskey each day, I wet the bed. These are things that if they're true, a soldier might not want to be completely honest about. So. This personality test in particular raises the question of response biases and whether response biases had an impact on the recruits' responses. The last thing I want to mention in this introductory lecture is that there are different types of personality tests. There are several different types, but in this class we're going to focus on two in particular, and that is the objective and the projective personality test. Objective tests, as I mentioned a little bit before, they're thought to be tests that involve less subjectivity, both in the meaning of the questions that the participant is responding to, it's thought that they're relatively straightforward, and also in the way that they're scored. They are not scored with any sort of a qualitative judgment. Because these tests require subjects to respond with a yes, no, a true, false, or a Likert type scale in which they choose a number that best represents their opinion of themselves, they're thought to be more objective in the way that they're scored. All you need to do to get a score for a person on an objective test is to sum or average particular items that measure that disposition or trait. The other kind of test is the projective test, and projective tests are often used in clinical settings, and they are believed by the clinicians who use them to be more sensitive to non-conscious parts of people's personalities, the parts of themselves that they may not be able to readily explain or describe. And they're based on this idea of the projective hypothesis, and that's that when you present a person with an ambiguous stimulus, so an abstract picture, for example, or you ask them to tell a story about a line drawing of two people in some sort of a setting, their responses will be influenced by their non-conscious beliefs, their emotions, and their experience. And so literally their personality will be projected onto the responses that they give you because the stimuli that you're presenting them with have no clear-cut answers. And the last thing I want to mention about personality tests is that they can greatly differ in terms of what they intend to measure or what they're designed to measure for people. You can have personality tests that measure single traits or single characteristics, and there are tests or inventories that are designed to measure sets of personality characteristics. For example, the NEOPI3 is a personality inventory that measures five broad domains of personality. Those tests that are designed to measure a single trait or disposition we call unidimensional. They're unidimensional because they are only measuring one dimension or one trait, one characteristic of personality. These include scales like the self-monitoring scale or rejection sensitivity or sensation seeking. These are individual characteristics that you can measure in people. On the other hand, we have what's referred to as the multidimensional or omnibus personality tests. And these are personality tests that measure more than one trait. In fact, often they measure a complete set of personality characteristics. These include five-factor inventories like the NEOPI3, 
the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, which measures personality and some clinical dimensions, and the California Psychological Inventory. Again, these measure multiple traits rather than a single trait or dimension. And these are also referred to as omnibus inventories because they measure more than one characteristic. One last point about omnibus or multidimensional tests. They can measure broad dimensions or broad domains like this one on the left. This is a five factor test and it's measuring each of the five factors and will give you a score for each of those five characteristics. You can also have omnibus or multidimensional tests that measure not only broad domains or broad traits like the five factors, but they can also give you the subtraits or the facet traits that combine to give you those broad domains. So for example, here are the facet level traits that combine to create a person's score and extroversion. So in this kind of a multidimensional inventory, you will not only get a score for each of these five broad traits, but you'll also be able to get scores for each of the facet traits that together make up each of those broad traits. So for example, for extroversion, you'll get a score for friendliness, gregariousness, assertiveness, activity level, excitement seeking, and cheerfulness. And this will give you a much finer grained description of an individual's personality than just a broad domain score alone.